What's up guys, I'm Steven. And I'm Kylie, and we've been getting some great questions from you guys in the comment section lately, so we've rounded up a few of them to answer for you today. We'll be talking about hiring for your short-term rental business, what to charge for cleaning fees. We'll also be going over how we structure our property management business and how we pay ourselves, and several more of your short-term rental questions. The first one is from Kate, and she asks, do you still hire an inspector, aka the perfection inspection for your properties? Currently, I use Guessy for hosts, and that's sends updates for bookings to the cleaner and I can send tasks. Maybe I need to add the other software. Also, do you hire a company with many cleaners or do you hire individual cleaners? And if individuals, how do you manage that schedule? How is it determined who goes when? Thanks. The perfection inspection is still something that's very important to us. All of our properties are inspected on the day that the guest arrives. So if it's a same day turnover, the cleaning team will come a little bit after checkout time and then our inspector will let a few hours pass, you know, and then come right before the guest check-in. If there's a day or two gap between someone checking out of the place and someone new checking in, then we still have the cleaners come on the day of checkout, just shortly after checkout. They do their cleaning, and then the day of the guest arrival, someone from our team will come and do the inspection. We just had an example come up yesterday of why the perfection inspections are important to us. I feel like this is gonna be good. We had a guest checkout on Sunday of this week. We had scheduled the cleaners to come that day, and I kind of scroll through camera notifications. I noticed a white truck. The cleaner usually drives a white truck, so I kept on scrolling because I don't watch the cameras in detail and just assumed the cleaning was done. What we didn't know is that our pool man recently traded in his red truck and now drives a white truck. So that was actually him parked in the driveway and not the cleaning team. Then yesterday, the guest had inquired about an early check-in and the house was cleaned and ready, so we thought. And so we sent our assistant property manager over there to check over the house about noon and he gets there and realized is the house hadn't been cleaned. I tried to call our cleaner and I couldn't get a hold of her. So our assistant PM got the laundry started and started on the cleaning. And then Steven drove over and did the entire rest of the cleaning himself while I stayed back here with the kids. Unfortunately, we had to retract the early check-in that we had offered, but you still did good. He got the guest in there by three o'clock. Came down to the wire, had to do some laundry because I found a stain and blah, blah, blah. Sometimes you just gotta jump into those things. And our perfection inspection was key to figure figuring that out ourselves versus having a guest show up and walk into that situation. Oh my God, this place is a mess. That's not a common thing. A cleaner just not showing up for a cleaning and also not realizing it for several days that they had missed a clean. Like that was a total breakdown for multiple people. But really the point of the inspection is just because we are all human and we all do make mistakes. It's not easy to clean a 2000 square foot house and not miss a single detail. It's not easy to clean a 500 square foot house and not miss a single detail. So we just like to provide that second set of eyes. Regarding who our cleaners are, we have several different firms across different markets markets. Some are individuals, some are medium-sized cleaning companies, and it just varies by who we found and made relationships with. The individuals that we work with, they have, you know, a dedicated helper or two that are always with them. I would be a little bit nervous hiring a solo cleaner that didn't have that sort of like built-in help just in case, you know, they got sick or they're unavailable for some reason. All the cleaners use Breezeway, and we've mentioned this before, we are transitioning to Turno. And the reason for that switch from Breezeway way to turno is not because we have any issues with breezeway we've been really happy with it it just comes down to that we're getting free access to turno with our property management software so we figured let's try it out let's see if it works for us and we'll save about 300 dollars a month with our large portfolio by not being charged for turno all right next question this one is from laura she asks when you do a rental greater than a week do you have your cleaners come in every week so a mid-stay cleaning is something that's always available if a guest wants it whether they're there for five nights or a whole month, but it's not something that we require. We do have an agreement with our cleaners when it comes to midterm rentals that they know it's a midterm rental. So we tell them to set their rates accordingly. When they don't see a house for maybe four or five, six weeks, it's going to be a little extra work compared to a short-term rental turnover. Next question is from Julie and she said, maybe you should get real jobs and not add to the housing crisis. It's interesting. We do have real jobs and we're in the hospitality business and our economic impact is pretty big, I think. But anyways, there'll always be haters. 
Taylor was right. Haters gonna hate, 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 hate. Next question, hopefully a good one, is from Sylvia, and she said, I'm new in the short-term rental world, and this is one thing I've been contemplating. Should I charge for cleaning or not? And if I don't charge, how do I fold that into the price without having a track record yet to base it on? Any ideas? We've done quite a bit of experimenting with this. We've tried eliminating the cleaning fee altogether. We've tried a hybrid model where we're lowering the cleaning fee that the guest is paying. It's less than what we're being charged for by the cleaners and then padding the rest of that back into the nightly rate. And then we also kind of have the typical scenario where we are charging guests what our cleaner charges us. When we've eliminated the cleaning fee altogether, we try and make up for that in the nightly rates as much as possible. But if it's a short stay, like a two night stay, it's really kind of not possible. And so we ended up getting quite a few short stays, two night stays where the type of clientele we we're getting was just not the best because the prices were cheap. So I really wouldn't say that's our favorite thing. We tend to have liked more of the hybrid model. Eliminating the cleaning fee did help at like one or two properties that were kind of struggling to get through the summer months. But what Steven said was true. It was bringing in kind of a crowd that we weren't super excited about. And the hybrid model is probably our favorite model. So for example, at a property where we're maybe being charged 180 for cleaning, we're charging the guest $100 and then we're baking in that 80 into the nightly rate. One point I'd like to add is we wouldn't recommend padding your cleaning fee to inflate it more than you're being charged from your cleaner. Especially these days, guests are really critical of fees. So take a look at what your competitive set is charging for cleanings and maybe try and undercut that a bit and hopefully that works for you. Your cleaning fee should not be a money-making opportunity. Additional occupancy fee, resort fee, share fee? Next question is from Kimmy and she said, would love to see one on business structure. How are you set up? Do you have a holding LLC and then operating LLCs for the properties? Are the properties all under LLCs? How do you pay yourselves from your business? We have a property management company, Arrivals Incorporated, and that is set up as an S corporation, not an LLC. But Arrivals Incorporated is separate from our own property and ownership compared to our client's property ownership. And most of our clients are holding title either as an LLC or as a trust. As far as payment for Arrivals, we pay ourselves via W-2. So that's how we kind of handle the payment of our salary as employees of Arrivals Inc. As far as payment for the properties that we own, all of the properties in our portfolio are all under the same account on each booking platform. So for example, on Airbnb, we have one account that's, you know, properties managed by Kylie. We don't have Arrivals managing the properties that we own. So for example, we personally buy all of the supplies for our beach duplex in contrast to Arrivals buying all the supplies for the properties that we manage here in the desert. We do that so we can consider our own property self-managed, not managed by a management company. And in the past, that's helped helped us with a short-term rental tax loophole, which gives us more favorable tax treatment for being active participants and you get better treatment of that income. This is less important now that we are classified as real estate professionals from a tax standpoint, but we've still kept it this way so far. As far as money for the properties that we own, the Airbnb or other booking platform income goes into personally owned accounts that we hold. Then we pay our cleaners and other expenses that the property incurs out of that personal account. So that's all separate from Arrival Sync. Hope this makes sense. You lost me. It can get a little complicated come tax time. As long as you keep good records, and for us, what helps a lot is separate checking accounts for each property and credit cards, things like that. You should be okay. All right, next question is from Veronica, and she said, I'm still watching your videos and wondering if you have anything on examples for leaving a common welcome note for the treats I have purchased to leave our guests. Something simple, but nice. Thanks, guys. I love that you're super guest focused. When we were first getting started and we were house hacking our duplex in San Diego, we were leaving a handwritten note for every guest. But that won't make sense for a lot of people's situations. And once we moved offsite, it just really wasn't sustainable for us either. So we don't leave a personalized note at the snack basket anymore. We still do leave a snack basket and we leave cold drinks in the fridge, but we just don't leave that note. What we do instead, and we find it pretty easy to implement, is mention the snack basket in the check-in instructions. The last slide in our check-in instructions mentions that we have more information about the house and local 
area recommendations in the house manual and also to help themselves to the snacks on the counter and the drinks in the fridge. Don't mind if I do. All right, next question is, hi, do you guys have a social media page of any sort we could follow for some on the go inspo? We are on Instagram at Kylie and Steven. We are not the most active people on Instagram. We're trying, but we do share some more behind the scenes and sort of our day to day projects, usually in stories. That does make me think of kind of an associated question for you guys. How many people are podcast listeners? And would you be interested if we made our videos available in a podcast format in addition to keeping this going as long form YouTube videos? Great question. If that's something that you would be interested, please let us know in the comments. It's something that we would be open to as well. If there's interest. If they want to hear what we have to say, but they don't want to see your faces. I don't want to see your face. All right, next question is, thank you for sharing your experience. It's very insightful. Curious at what property count you've decided to hire or recommended to hire a PM assistant? This is gonna be such a personal thing and it's going to depend on so many factors. What you want to pass off to that assistant, if you're working another full-time job, how much you can afford to pay this person. For us, we did so much ourselves for so long and we really kind of still do. We talk to people and they're really shocked to hear that we're managing 50 properties and don't have this big team of assistants or VAs uh, to automate messaging and try and automate our business. The thing is for us, messaging is so important. Like authentic guest messaging is so important. And there are other jobs that we would prefer to outsource first before messaging. That being said, we do have some immediate plans to implement VAs, just not on guest messaging. I just got back from the STR Nation conference in San Diego last weekend or earlier this week. Let me know in the comments if you'd like us to do kind of a recap video of my my time there. Steven had to stay back. Well, we can talk about that in the video if we do one. I had the pleasure of chatting with Bill Faith for a little while and he really validated our beliefs about authentic guest messaging. But at the same time, he had some amazing advice on areas in our business that we can and should be implementing VAs without sort of sacrificing some of the core values of our business. So that's coming. Definitely stay tuned for that. We'll share all about it. But as far as when to hire a PM assistant, we've had people on our team just on like a one-off contract 1099 basis since we had probably about 10 properties. And then I think it was when we hit like 30 or 35 properties that we actually hired somebody on our payroll. And that was just last December. I wouldn't recommend hiring someone to do too much too early. It's really important in this business, at least our perspective, is to really learn it. Learn everything. And if you're hiring that out, you might start to miss some details. Learn it all, figure out what you don't like, and then outsource that. I hire people to do things I don't want to do. The next question is from Jay and they said, I have a seven bedroom home I'm furnishing right now, but I'm not sure which couch to go with. So our biggest piece of advice here is to make sure you have enough seating in the living room for the number of guests that you intend to sleep. Especially with a bedroom count that high, seven bedrooms is a lot and it's not easy or cheap to put comfortable seating for that many guests into a living room, but it's super important. Next question says, oh, I noticed the robo pool vacuum. Do you leave that in when guests are there or do you remove it after every clean if you have guests. That hand vacuum that we showed, I think that's what they're talking about, was for an above ground spa. And we do leave those in the closet at the properties, but I'm not sure if anyone actually uses them. We like them though. We'll leave a link in the description if you want to check it out and you have an above ground spa. For in-ground pools, we do have built-in pool cleaner vacuums at some properties. Those are important to stay in the water. The sealed components, it's bad for them if they do dry out. We just tell guests in that instance, like, hey, you can move this thing in the water away from where you're swimming and just don't take it out, please. Okay, next question is from BF Homes and they asked, can you please share who edits all your YouTube videos? Love you guys' style. Yes, we can. We love her style too. Paulina is great and we'll leave her contact information in the video description below. I'm not crying, you're crying. And then our last question for today is from Justin. I have a long one. He said, so what's the price you charge? I do the same thing and I'm creating world-class properties for owners and with the time commitment, I've decided to stop taking any more clients because it's not worth it. Instead, I'd rather spend that time and design ideas on my own properties, totally get that, so that I can get the recurring return instead of making a few thousand at one time. Curious what you guys charge and thoughts. So by the question, I'm guessing he's asking what we charge for design and setup. It's going to depend on the scope of work, but for a full service setup, meaning that we're taking an empty house all the way to making it a turnkey STR, 
are, then we're going to charge somewhere between 10 and 15,000. And that's just for our design and setup fee. That does not include the cost of materials or furnishings. That being said, we also don't do any design and setup for people where we don't also then get the follow on management contract. There is some recurring revenue that is going to come from that. Although we also have learned, don't count on that. It could go away anytime. They decide to sell after six months or whatever, then the recurring management revenue is never a guarantee. Make sure your setup fee is fair compensation for the time you feel like you put into it. And for that ongoing management fee, we're currently charging 25% of gross revenue for short-term rental properties and 20% for midterm or 30-day rental properties. And that's for full service property management. And we also do include all the guest consumables in that commission. So owners aren't getting like one-off free stocking fees or charges for home supplies. That's all for today, guys. If you have any follow-up questions, be sure to leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.